Okay, I've got um, from our site, typically we have uh, Dr. Gloria Bashevitz. She's um, in a, a different um, office, but she will also be commenting and presenting one of the cases. At the end of the cases, we'll see if we can get some follow-up to um, last month. I just want to, we've got quite a few attendees. We um, have had this as a recurring meeting um, for the last four to five years, quite a few years, and typically are discussing um, cases with the intersection of addiction and toxicology. A lot of emergency medicine, um, hospital-based care of uh, patients with substance use disorders, pharmacology, toxicology, um, and um, if anyone has any cases that they'd like to present for future meetings, just um, you know, send me an email, and then ideally we'd have um, some slides in advance. So let's get right in, as usually we have a lot of um, discussion and you know, sometimes have to truncate the cases. We have four cases today. So the first case is a 49-year-old gentleman with poorly controlled diabetes. He's a long history of IV drug use. He presents to the emergency department with complaints of worsening vein wounds and discharge of pus in his lower extremity. He is unfortunately homeless. He's been homeless for quite some time and he's not able to walk. The pain is unbearable. Uh, he uses uh, heroin and some street methadone. When he can get the street methadone, he also uses cocaine and intermittently marijuana. Uh, he has had not a lot of contact with the healthcare system and uh, simply came in because he couldn't walk and the pain was terrible. Here's some pictures of his lower extremities. This is what he looked like in the emergency department. He's got red, uh, swollen legs, areas of ulceration. Uh, behind the calf, it's worse. There's several areas of punched out type lesions. He describes that this isn't from skin popping, but rather he has excoriations. He gets to itching his legs and he notes that um, sometimes it itches and it starts bleeding and then weeping and he thinks that that's what happened and it just simply got out of control. Now, he is febrile. His other vital signs are normal. He's unkempt, soaked in urine, uh, he just couldn't get to change his clothes and didn't have access to grooming, obviously. The ulcers are, at the largest, about six centimeters and, again, punched out areas both sides. There's some swelling and redness to the left knee as well. Initially, he says he's not really interested in stopping heroin use. The program's treatment doesn't work, um, and um, he's interested in pain control. Uh, started on antibiotics in the emergency department. Cultures are obtained, and, and he's admitted, and this is a fairly regular consult, um, someone with an opioid use disorder, um, first the service will be consulted for an evaluation of appropriateness for opioid agonist therapy, uh, which one, and then you know, potentially pain control if there's an acute ind indication, and then you know, we'll work with some others on linkage to treatment. So I'm wondering though first, what do you do for this gentleman's pain? What are your options, and would anything change with a um, individual, you know, that has a opiate dependence. He's not showing a lot of symptoms in the emergency department um, in terms of withdrawal, but he is uncomfortable and restless, and his last use was a few hours prior to coming in. So let me see, to comment, you have to show your, click on the show hands, or um, you could also click on a comment, and I'll be able to read that, and I'll read the um, comments. So Derek um, Eisner was the only one that had his hand up. Let me unmute. Derek, you wanna what what would you do for this patient? So I know that there's an awful lot of E D physicians that are on. What are you gonna do for pain in this in this patient? How about somebody from Emory? Hey, can you hear us now? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so this is Elena Steck. I'm here with uh, Patrick Murray and a couple of our students and one of our international fellows. It, you know, uh, one of the questions that came up as we were discussing amongst ourselves is, you know, oh, do you still give someone who has an opioid use disorder or opioids for acute pain? Um, 
certainly if he's having acute pain, the first thing that I would reach for is something high potency like fentanyl. Um, but I also think if we didn't have this horrible ketamine shortage, he would be a really good patient for pain dose ketamine. Um, and if we had it available, that's probably what I would reach for first. Those are great thoughts. Now, he hasn't gotten opioids in the ED at this point, and he's not, I mean, he's uncomfortable and having pain, but it's not, you know, limiting imminent procedure or, you know, other options. So um, certainly using opioids. Would anybody do any other different thoughts? With a comment from Derek to consider methadone, um, you know, I think that methadone may be an option. Um, as I see him going into withdrawal, I don't think I would use methadone right off the bat for acute pain, but once he goes into withdrawal, we kind of gauge his level of dependence that may be an option for um, bridging the, the gentleman to an opiate treatment program, or not bridging, but if, the, if you have the capability of following up. We have um, any other thoughts? Would anybody use buprenorphine? So I'm not seeing anyone raising their hands in this. So if there's any issues, uh, make sure and send a text um, if you're having issue raising hands to comment. I'm going to start calling on some of the attendees otherwise. Beth, Bilden, let me unmute you here and see what your comments are. Okay, Beth, you should be unmuted in a second here. Okay. Or let me go ahead. You're unmuted. You can hear me okay? Yes. Great. So it, once, you know, certainly trying to exhaust non-opioid analgesics depending on his level of pain, it's not going to hurt to try things, you know, certainly not waiting between, long periods of time in between. So if you give him something that's non-opioid, if it's not working fairly quickly, then moving on to opioids. So my concern with buprenorphine would be not knowing exactly, you know, it, in terms of eliciting withdrawal, giving the partial agonist with some heroin on board if he's taken that. When did he last take the methadone would be part of that as well. So I, I would be a little bit concerned because of eliciting withdrawal. I, if he needed opioid analgesics, I guess I would have started with a short-acting opioid and treating his pain, which then by default, it's not the primary admitting, di it, that's the primary admitting diagnosis, it's not his opioid addiction, so that you'd be covering him at least initially and then deciding and then talking to him about his options once the sort of acute exacerbation of his discomfort has been treated. I do have one question. Why necessarily, it was a, a good point, but why necessarily go with a high potency as opposed to just something else. You know what I mean? Even whether they use just like Dilaudid, why fentanyl? So that those are great comments. And I'm going to unmute uh, Elena again at Emory and she'll be able to respond. You know, uh, you know, hydromorphone would work just as well. Um, I, I picked fentanyl just because it was, you know, first thing that came to mind, but I'd be just as happy to, to choose dilaudid. You know, one last thought, though, in terms of that, as you were describing, so the, fent the affinity for opioid receptors between buprenorphine and fentanyl is pretty close, and so that actually may be the better choice, and then if, he, if you choose to transition them to buprenorphine at some point during his hospital stay and then prior to discharge, it may be a much easier transition. I like that. That's a good point. Good. Uh, Samia, you have a comment. I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say the same, the same thing about the concern, Tim, with the buprenorphine, especially with the swelling in his knee, and you don't know if you might need to aspirate or, you know, you don't know what's going on. Plus, with the ulcers, it didn't look like 
you didn't mention an abscess, but with these patients that might need an IND, I, I do too worry about the buprenorphine. I guess the question I have is something like IV bupinex or sub, um, subutex high dose, would that be, would that precipitate a withdrawal? Um, if you, I mean, I th think you said he used the heroin a few hours prior. Um, but I guess one of the thoughts I had was something like IV, IV suboxone or bupinex and or sublingual uh, subutex high dose um, because I wouldn't be as worried about, I, I know in theory you can get withdrawal, but I wouldn't be as worried about just the monotherapy compared to sublingual buprenorphine in someone like him. So those are, those are good thoughts and you bring up some additional ideas. Um, you know, the, um, in, in, in um, general, I think when I'm using buprenorphine, I'm going to usually use just the dual product. Um, I don't really differ in the practice because I don't, it doesn't really change. The naloxone really not absorbed. And, um, but in IV buprenorphine, there are some differences. We have a sister hospital where it's not available. And at Strong, we have, I think, you know, a limited number of vials, the 300 microgram vials, but it is part of our algorithm when we, we have a patient who's on buprenorphine uh, medication-assisted treatments to give an extra dose, to split the doses, to go up on dose, uh, to try if it's an acute procedural type pain, to give a 300, 150 to 300 microgram IV dose of buprenorphine. So those are interesting options. Um, I'm going to move ahead from here and just kind of come and on how we approach this patient. Um, he's also found to have depression fracture on x-ray, the tibial plateau, it's indeterminate age, um, was advised he needed the joint aspiration, and again, he's not really shown a lot of withdrawal symptoms. Um, so yeah, we elected to offer him um, buprenorphine to treat both pain and to treat withdrawal, assuming it was going to develop, and um, had him on, um, he was, uh, overnight um, held any opiates or didn't give any opiates overnight and from the heroin use um, prior, it was about total of 10 hours. And in the morning, just gave a two milligram dose of the dual product and then scheduled a half of a, a strip, which is four milligrams or four, four slash one, uh, four times a day or two, six hours. And that seemed to take care of his pain and, and um, he wasn't showing any withdrawal after that. Um, he was asking for a, another dose during the day because he felt sweaty and was interpreting some of the sweatiness as having some withdrawal, although when, he, when, he, when we talked to him about this, he really didn't have other, any other withdrawal symptoms and was just struggling with um, you know, a lot of issues. His life had been pretty much abruptly changed. Now in the hospital, he's going to have to get an arthrocentesis, and he's declining the knee arthrocentesis due to concern about pain. So I have two questions. What would one do about if pain control good except for really acute procedures now and someone's on buprenorphine and um, there's just a time of day, physical therapy, a procedure, what are your options? We've already discussed these a little bit. And then the other is how do you negotiate with a patient? This is a common thing, abscess IND, somebody comes in, maybe they're on methadone or buprenorphine and they're doing really fine and they're not showing a lot of pain, but they're really upset about getting a procedure, maybe interpreting the, the pending procedure is, you know, going to be painful. What are your options for doing that and how does somebody negotiate with the patient? I see Derek has a comment. I'm going to take you off mute, Derek Eisner. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Um, well, uh, IV buprenorphine comes to mind um, as far as for the procedure itself. Um, you know, I mean, he's got some pretty severe ID issues and, um, you know, limiting us being able to treat him going forward, at least diagnostically. I mean, certainly at risk for an amputation um, if he goes untreated. You know, so I, I would try to explain to him, you know, our concerns and the need to kind of get a better idea of where the extent of his infection. Um, but, I, you know, IV buprenorphine, I think, um, you know, would be the first thing that comes to mind and 
wouldn't derail, you know, our current uh, treatment plan as far as kind of getting them on a long acting that would be a good bridge to eventual outpatient. You know, this guy may be on IV antibiotics for a long time, depending on what his ultimate diagnosis is. Okay, good. Thank you. Samia, do you have another comment? Uh, no, Tim, sorry, I, no. Okay. okay, take down your hand if you're, anybody else have any other thoughts or comments? John Benitez had mentioned, you know, why start with an opioid? I think that's certainly an excellent point. There's other analgesics and, you know, non acetaminophen, if the patient's not showing any withdrawal, then, um, you know, treat certainly to the level of pain and not going right to an opiate. And many emergency departments are now protocolizing, you know, the evidence-based alternatives to opioid therapy for pain. We've implemented that at Strong, and one of our clinical toxicologists was very involved in that. But some good op options for back pain and for headache and for various uh, common diagnoses where it's very common to reach for a short-acting opioid and send them with a prescription potentially. Um, Beth, are you, do you have another comment or question? Question? Um, the first Go is, what did, he, what did he get in the emergency department for pain? In the emergency department, he, he was given acetaminophen and offered non but he wasn't given opioids um, in the ED. He was offered um, additional doses of acetaminophen, and we got involved as it was later um, in the um, emergency department course, a few hours later, and I talked to him about doing this induction with buprenorphine, and he seemed to be initially hesitant, but then okay with that and kind of understood that there would be a delay to trying the um, Suboxone um, to make sure that his last use washed out of his system. So it's kind of a ne negotiation, and he seemed to be doing okay. He was complaining of pain. It was certainly worse than limiting his walking, but he was doing okay for the time being. Okay. And then the other, which sort of ties together with that, I think one of the things that can be started in the emergency department is just staff education. So when the, and for all the staff, not just nurses, but for example, when they're calling report for the admission to remind, you know, depending on what's chosen, is here's a patient who, if he ends up on opioids, if he, let's say that he were, you know, so he's prescribed buprenorphine, but if something else had been chosen, reminding staff that it's not drug seeking. If a patient has pain and they need something for pain, and the, and the part of that specifically is anticipating that he may need pay higher doses of opioids. So that's mm -hmm. the plan for treatment. And again, it's it's more framing it in terms of the stigma of that, and that he's going to be asking so that staff can actually anticipate that upstairs by going in. If he's not asked for something, you know, not putting him in the position of, you know, I got to have this, but they're going in and saying, hey, how's your pain? And you know what I mean? So I, I think, think those are great points. Education, so. Yeah, no, and I think that's really a great point that this is somebody who's tolerant. He, um, you know, the pain control will potentially keep him in the ED. I mean, otherwise signing, it'd be very counterproductive to have him sign out and try and go to another hospital. I think reassuring that also we're going to treat, we have options to treat the withdrawal and then can treat the pain on top of that and and clearly explaining that. Um, also clearly explaining to the admitting, well, the admitting team and the, and the handoff that um, overnight in the next few hours, if you get a call for pain options, here's the plan in the morning and there's also some misperceptions that buprenorphine won't have an analgesic effect. It's just going to take care of the withdrawal. So, um, you know, they, I think communicating that in a note and also verbally is, is very important. And, and I think this gentleman, if he was, you know, having a lot of discomfort and really it was limiting exam and assessment, then giving him a, you know, the going from a stepwise approach, non to short-acting opioids to higher dose if needed, and then we can plan the induction around, um, you know, timing you know, when appropriate. Um, there's one other comment, uh, Niraj uh, Chabra, I'm gonna take you off um, mute, see if you're able to. Next panelist, I think. Hear me? Go ahead. Yes, I can. 
Yeah, so I just uh, wanted to get back to the non-opioid options in a patient that may be maintained on buprenorphine, uh, especially for an acute procedure, acute trauma. I think uh, doing a nerve block with bupivacaine for an extremity injury or an extremity procedure is pretty effective, well-described in the literature, and it's if there's a qualified provider, that's even something you can place a catheter and, you know, maintain them on that for, you know, a day or so, and patients do pretty well with that. So I think it should at least be considered. Yeah, those are those are great comments. Utilizing nerve blocks and um, you know different techniques for you know pain and sites that are amendable to that. All right, let's um, move forward. So this um, the patient uh, was amendable to stain on the buprenorphine. I think it's hard to switch for the procedure. A lot of times they see in the hospital if someone's on buprenorphine, it's held, sometimes held for a couple of days even, and then, um, you know, an opioid is used, whether it's for sedation, like for an echocardiogram, or if it's truly just a, you know, acute short procedure, and then that entails restarting it potentially if it's held long enough. So we've really tried to limit that and just continue to buprenorphine and just overcome it with, um, if indicated, for agonists. Now, this is a joint aspiration and, um, you know, explaining it that it's going to be, um, you know, numbed and, you know, it's, it's very brief. And I also offered an additional dose of um, buprenorphine peri procedure. And ultimately, with the dose of lorazepam, he was anxious given before uh, he consented. And um, he ultimately requires surgery for debridement and washout. He's got a septic joint as well as, as um, he needs some debridement uh, for uh, his wounds, ulcers, and there's a large abscess under it. I think um, that's another panelist, or another attendee had mentioned. So pre-surgery, we did have the buprenorphine held during the morning, and full agonist fentanyl was utilized during the procedure, um, along with the anesthesia, and then um, his buprenorphine was continued and split uh, to every six hours with extra doses given twice, uh, six hours after the uh, surgery was done. This is his wound. You can see it's not a small area, and he's got a, some debridement and cleaning in other areas. And he's doing really well, ultimately, on 8 milligrams KD of buprenorphine, except for the dressing changes. And this is really just an anticipatory. It hurts when they do the dressing changes, and you know that's not an option. And um, so I'm wondering now, with um, this type of wound, he's doing well, maintained on buprenorphine for the day. What would you do for the dressing changes, or would anyone um, simply switch to full agonist or methadone at this point? What are your options for this? For someone who hasn't commented, let me um, let me see if anyone's got their hand up. Derek, I'm going to unmute you again. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry to beat a dead horse. Um, I would go with the IV buprenorphine for the procedure. Okay, IV buprenorphine. What about? I, it, I mean, it's just it's titratable. It's it, you know then that way going forward you have an idea whether or not this works in this patient. I mean, you get an idea of what his tolerance is, what dose works for him. So, again, like 0.15 to 0.3 milligrams, you know, IV. You can repeat that every 15, 20 minutes as needed, but. You know, I think the key is is um, just to kind of develop that bond that you talked about so these patients have trust in their providers, which, you know, you've talked about many times in the past. That's a very good point. Does somebody from Rocky Mountain want to comment? Do you have any thoughts on pain control at this point? You're unmuted. I can hear us. Can anyone? Yes. 
Yeah, hi, this is Nick Brandyoff, one of the Tox fellows. Uh, I mean, I think depending on what, you know, IV people north may maybe an option. They're also just maybe, uh, again, going back to potentially sort of low-dose ketamine um, or some other sort of analgesic from that endpoint. Uh, I don't necessarily think doing uh, a full agonist is going to uh, be beneficial in these, these changes. Um, but, you know, I think uh, I would I would personally go with sort of a, a low-dose ketamine for this guy for pain control. Okay, thank you. It's interesting you should say ketamine. I had a couple of uh, chat comments. Uh, Henry Swoboda had mentioned about um, analgesic ketamine. Um, Beth Bilden had commented on potentially fentanyl, so potent opioid, uh, during the procedure. Does um, anyone from the SUNY Upstate group want to comment on uh, pain control? Just need to unmute you here one second. Go ahead. Hey, Tim. Yeah, this is Willie, and we're here with some of our fellows and Gina and Brett, and uh, we kind of been having the same discussion as you guys have already been talking about. We didn't have any additional recommendations or thoughts. Okay, Nick Nock, I want to, my, my colleague at um, the U of R uh, comments that um, ketamine is hardly ever a real option due to nursing restrictions and protocols. And so, um, you know, while, you know, for a lot of the patients we'll discuss this, it requires moving to a um, typically an ICU floor um, or step down unit, I believe. And there's a lot of restrictions and limitations and doing this every day for a dressing change would really require a higher level of care moving them into the ICU. So while it makes sense, it, practically it's very hard. Um, it's a, another discussion on you know, logistics around the ketamine, but it's, it's been very hard to do that. We do that at, have an option in the ED, but I think logistically it's, it's complicated as well. So um, let's, let me move on. This um, patient was kept on the buprenorphine naloxone, and initially we tried fentanyl and a little bit of oral lorazepam about an hour prior because it's mostly anxiety, I think, also, and um, relaxing him before the procedure. I mean, mostly anxiety that is, that's, you know, driving some of his decision. He certainly has real pain. Um, and we recommended fentanyl along with the titration mechanism, start with 200 micrograms, IV push up to 400, up to... 600, and the first day they tried 200 as well as m maximizing non opioid analgesics before, and he had trouble, didn't really tolerate that. The second day they tried 400 micrograms and did a little bit better, but it was still challenging. It didn't escalate the dose with that, I and mean, he wasn't too happy. But the, 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 that day we had um, challenges from nursing um, stating that this is conscious sedation if the two meds are given near the procedure and it had to do with the way they were ordered and they're very un, um, anxious about ketamine titration on the floor. So, um, oh, we switched to hydromorphone, which turned out to be a much better opioid and easy to use to overcome the buprenorphine. Started at two, then four. Um, he ultimately settled out at six milligrams, which was very effective for analgesia without somnolence. Um, without dysphoria, he just got one dose during the procedure and was tolerating the dressing changes very nicely, um, and there was no changes or manipulation of his um, buprenorphine naloxone. Um, you know, and it, it's recently, I don't have the, the KI or, or some of the binding information, but um, you know, we've got a couple of pharmacologists on the um, call as well. Maybe they can comment a little bit, but um, I found the hydromorphone is much more effective if you want to overcome buprenorphine for the analgesic effect. I've really not seen a lot of them when we do use it. If in a situation like this, it seems to be um, fairly useful, and I don't you don't get a lot of the other side effects. So it seems to be helping with the analgesia, and you know, we're we're dosing I think um, fairly appropriately. I know I I've seen Neil Benowitz on, and maybe can you comment a little bit about you know, the pharmacology of that, maybe the differences between the um, fentanyl versus um, hydromorphone? 
Uh, I really don't know any specific data saying that one is more effective at overcoming fibronorphine effects. Sorry. Thank you for commenting. Does um, anybody else have on the panel any experience or knowledge of, of um, you know, the differences or, you know, affinity? Let's see. No one wants to take the... Well, So this is the comments, how would it, now is a great time to get the pain service involved to see if they could do a nerve block with a catheter. And I think that that is a good option that was brought up to the team and it wasn't pursued because he was doing fine with the um, titration of the, or the use of the hydromorphone and nursing got comfortable with this. He stayed on the floor and ultimately orthopedic surgery was doing the dressing changes, had switched over to nursing. So he's doing well with that. The patient is still doing well. Now the challenge is physical therapy. He's starting PT, but things are progressing and we'll um, revisit this potentially as some of the bridges from the issues become, where do we go from the hospital? Um, if he needs a skilled nursing facility, some of the, there's a lot of cha a challenge in continuing buprenorphine at a sniff. Uh, we do have a housing option for patients that are homeless and or have real precarious uh, social situations where they can stay to recuperate and have medical follow-up and the Medicab, things like that, a sit. So there are some options. The pain service is really when somebody's on opioid agonist therapy or has a substance use disorder, they typically um, deferred the consults and asked that the talk service get involved. Um, except for obviously putting in a nerve block or a procedural type of analgesia. So uh, we end up working pretty closely with them and some of the, the anesthesia fellows will rotate um, and our addiction medicine fellows spend some time on the pain service as well. So it works out pretty good. Let's move on to the second case. And this one I'm going to, after the first couple of slides, switch to uh, Dr. Bashevitz, the uh, addiction psychiatry uh, director of um, strong recovery, but just a little background on how the patient had come in. Uh, she's a 38-year-old female sent to the ED for burn care. Uh, it turns out that she has a pretty good-sized burn on her thigh with, um, from a curling iron. She had taken extra gabapentin and collapsed. She has a history of seizures. These are all drug-induced. Uh, she thinks that maybe she may have had a seizure. Um, she didn't seek help for approximately a week. Uh, she's on methadone, and initially the consult was um, to advise on the methadone dose. The dose was unknown and um, also um, potentially opioid dosing or pain control in somebody on opioid agonist therapy. So my question is how, before um, we get too far into the case, what um, mechanisms do you have for confirming a methadone dose where in your hospital um, or with various um, programs. We've discussed this before, but there's a lot greater number of individuals on the line. I'm wondering what options do people have in, in working with their opiate treatment programs, um, whether it's on site or other areas. What about, I'm going to call on Henry as I find, there we go. Henry, can you comment on working with your opiate treatment program? How would you confirm a dose for somebody that says they're on a certain dose of methadone? Or what do you even do in that setting? Yeah, I mean, usually uh, we'll, we'll, I mean, we need to find out from the patient which program they're in. Here in Chicago, there's just so many that it's like, I, you know, I couldn't call around to, to find or, you know, depending on the situation, you know, we have intubated patients and whatever, we'll try and get a hold of family and see if they're aware of where the patient seeks treatment. And, um, you know, I mean, it certainly can be difficult over the weekend, you know, if it's, or, you know, if it's sometime, you know, some places close around noon and so if they come in, um, it can be hard to confirm a dose. 
So, you know, I mean, if, if we have a urine that's positive for methadone and a stated history that the patient's on methadone, you know, and we still can't confirm their dose, a lot of times we'll give them like 30 milligrams and, um, and you know, wait until we actually can get in touch with their program. But um, other than actually, you know, finding out where they, where they go um, and talking with their program, I don't have any good, good mechanisms to do so. Thank you. Um, what about Dr. Guyne? I'm going to try and unmute you. Now, having challenges unmuting some of the calls coming in. Does anybody have any? Other options here, we have two uh, opiate treatment programs. One of them is uh, affiliated with our institution and we're able to uh, call the emergency psychiatric uh, charge nurse 24 hours a day and they'll confirm when the patient last received their dose, what the dose is. The other program, we've reached out to the medical director so have um, ability to contact them um, and fairly quickly are able to get you know, the dose of somebody in the program. In the meantime, if someone's um, reporting a dose and, you know, they don't have a way of, of confirming it through, you know, um, previous notes, potentially if it's, if it's much above, uh, you know, if it's fairly high dose, we usually just dose at 30 milligrams of methadone. If there's obvious withdrawal, uh, give another 10. And then if there's pain, just use full agonists for the brief period while we're trying to confirm the dose. Um, once the dose is confirmed, we'll um, reinstate that. And you know, a lot of the consults are simply to reassure the primary team to just give the methadone because it's held um, as a patient um, is admitted. Or if they're requiring analgesia, it's uh, held because it's thought that with the other opioids, um, it'll be too much potentially. So it's not really thought of as background. So. This patient was put on, given the dose, the 30 milligram or the, the 90 milligrams the day she presented, and then it was split to 30 milligrams three times a day um, because she had a burn and it was, you know, she was asking for some pain meds, although she really didn't seem to be in very much discomfort. And we advised that in general, you could start with a one and a half times a normal dose, and for example, uh, 10 to 20 milligrams of oxycodone. And she very quickly realized that when she reported initial pain scores that were actually pretty low, because she was doing pretty good, that she got a lower dose and then found that if she reported higher scores, she would get a higher dose. So she was just giving the high score and getting oxycodone, you know, that max dose on top of the methadone until she had a procedure. So I'm going to switch to Dr. Beshevitz, going to unmute you and have Gloria give some background. Okay, ahead, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? All right. Um, so we wanted to give a little bit of background uh, since we uh, had extensive uh, knowledge of her. Uh, so basically she is a 38-year-old woman and she's used uh, opioid analgesic since age 17. She had a very quick progression to IV heroin use in her early 20s. She was uh, able to maintain sobriety on Suboxone uh, for about eight to nine years in her 20s. And uh, later on, she was prescribed benzos uh, by various uh, doctors and in the community. And she was taking uh, alprazolam at one point and clonazepam at another point. She relapsed when her father died in March 2015. Uh, and in 2015, she was uh, admitted to the opiate treatment program and methadone was started. So. Uh, she also had a history of psychiatric uh, problems, and she had actually had a history of four or five psychiatric admissions in the past. Her general, uh, her usual diagnosis um, was um, bipolar type 2 and, and panic disorder, and she had trials of the various medications listed uh, at various points in time over the few years that she was with us. Um, so the next. Uh, next slide, uh, Tim. I don't know if I can advance it. Okay. 
So I, I wanted to just give a little bit of background about what we do uh, in methadone maintenance regarding uh, noncompliance. And uh, because we talk about these issues from time to time. So um, in her case, initially she did okay, uh, though she had a lot of changes of psychiatric medicines uh, with her uh, psychiatrist. And we, ha we eventually, though, she began to not comply very well. She continued uh, cocaine and marijuana use and had very poor attendance at group. She did five from halfway houses, uh, but quickly relapsed after she got out of the halfway houses. So we had, along the way, we had three different intervent, what we call interventions for her. And these things are being done according to New York State uh, OASIS um, rules of um, intervention for patients. And different states may be different about this, uh, but this is the way that it's worked in our program. So we had interventions in which she meets with her therapist and a supervisor, and they recommend a higher level of care and document it all. Um, in her case, the residential treatment and mental health care was recommended. She continued to refuse and eventually was told that if she continued to refuse again, she would be discharged from the program um, because use was continuing as well and she wasn't cooperating with anything else. So at the time of the medical director's appeal, um, the medical director's appeal is the last, last stage in this. Uh, that's where we either uphold or overturn the discharge decision of the staff. So she had been discharged by the staff, but when she had the medical director's appeal, she showed us, well, she talked about how she was still refusing the residential treatment facility that we recommended, and she also told us about the burn. She had told her therapist about the burn in the past, and of course the therapist said, well, you should go see your doctor. No one had actually seen it until the time of this appeal. So we, uh, we actually saw this burn at, the, at that time and saw the tremendous uh, uh, amount of eschar. Uh, it looked pretty scary, and uh, we advised her to seek care, which she actually did. She actually went to another hospital in town and was not admitted there. Uh, but was told to go to uh, go follow up with a plastic uh, a, a, a wound care specialist, uh, and then she decided to go to Strong and was admitted uh, at Strong. And I'm not sure exactly what the parameters of that decision were, but we actually decided to uh, pend her um, her discharge because of this situation. We didn't uh, want um, anything to interfere with the. Um, the wound care and debridement that she would be needing. So uh, just a little background on this. Um, any questions about this before we go back to uh, Tim's information? Okay, if you have questions or comments, certainly just raise your hands. Um, so, just remind everybody, we go for another about 25 minutes. It um, starts 1.15 to 2.30, I think. So just um, we have another case after this as well. Um, this um, patient on the day two had been maxing out her oxycodone dosing and was getting a little sleepy and really looking quite fine in terms of having pain. She had the procedure for the dressing for the um, debridement and wound detention. And um, after the procedure, it was suggested that she just simply, you know, stay on the methadone and use non-opioid analgesics unless there's some, you know, further need of wound debridement and care. And she did fine with that. And the questions, we've got a couple of cases in the hospital right now in which gabapentin abuse was the primary culprit. Most of them either in opioid users or with opioids um, together in somebody that's opioid dependent. Um, so I'm wondering what are others' experiences re regarding the gabapentin abuse? Um, and then what do you do? This is a patient who's taking gabapentin regularly. It seems more binging on it than really taking it regularly, but um, what would one do with that? The recommendation, at least here, although this case is kind of evolving, it was to um, stop the gabapentin. Um, I'm wondering 
what options and maybe someone can comment on gabapentin abuse. Let me um, go back to the SUNY F-State program and see if anyone is actually unmuted. Hey, James, it's Willie. Can you hear us? Yes. I mean, I think that, that we're seeing more and more frequently a uh, high incidence of, of gabapentin abuse here. Um, and, uh, and, and obviously, I think this reflects national trends. There was a, a recent uh, report out of one of the uh, Emmys offices down south where they looked at like five states and the opioid overdose deaths and the incidence in which gabapentin was involved is, is on the rise. Um, as far as what to do with it, I think it's still uh, it's a difficult um, issue to treat. You know, a lot of times it's not a direct GABA agonist, but it does modulate GABA, so it does the withdrawal kind of looks like a minor, minor benzo withdrawal when we see it. Um, so generally, I mean, personally, I, I recommend just trying to taper the gabapentin and seeing how the patient can do uh, over the course of a few days on a, on a declining dose um, and, and try to avoid other interventions to, to treat their symptoms just because it's, oh, aside from like anti-emetics, um, just because it's, it is such a, a mild withdrawal. Yeah, those are good comments. I've seen withdrawal in a couple of individuals that were using very high doses, and most often I run into it in somebody that's getting it in the outpatient setting, and they don't, there's not really an indication, and it's um, you know commonly you know misused, and or that's identified in a patient. I'll have them you know come off, and most of these I'm prescribing buprenorphine too. So um, the buprenorphine is usually the carrot on the stick. Um, at our NYSAM conferences here, at one of the faculty presented an overview of gabapentin abuse, and, and it struck me that it was not surprised, but nearly 90% or maybe even over 90% of the prescriptions for gabapentin are off, are off label. There's, there's not a known indication for it, and it's for everything from anxiety to back pain to arthritis to it just helps me settle down to insomnia to it's not the uncommon adjunctive agent for seizure control or I believe it has a neuropathy, a certain type of neuropathy, maybe an indication. So, um, you know, I, just this last week, New Jersey had put it on their prescription monitoring program for surveillance. Um, I know that there's a bill in New York State to get it listed along with um, the prescription monitoring, you know, the other controlled substances. And um, some state, other states already have this. Is Ohio, Pennsylvania, one of the Carolinas, and there may be others. Um, in Monroe County, um, where Rochester is located, in 2016, there were just over 200 fatalities involving opioids, majority of which were fentanyl-related, um, and it was in the top eight. I think it was the number six most, com of most common other drug found in the opioid fatalities behind heroin, cocaine, other synthetic opioids, um, alcohol, and benzodiazepines. I think it was essentially the next. So certainly increasing and, and people take it to potentiate the opioid to mitigate withdrawal um, and for a variety of other reasons. And you know, I think accessibility, lack of, in most places, the lack of detection that it's not going to be picked up on a screen, um, you know, for drug court or probation, it's, it's common. We've ended up adding this to the immunoassay on the outpatient treatment program I cover, and it was nearly 30% had non-prescribed gabapentin showing up in the buprenorphine patients in the opiate um, program that we have, So, and which is similar to other data. So um, gabapentin abuse is pretty, pretty common. So and this patient was binging on it. We really didn't uh, put together a taper, but often I would taper, I think, comment echo Willie's comments, um, um, potentially tapering at mild benzo withdrawal. Depends on the amount, certainly, that they're using. I think, Derek, you had um, another comment, and then we'll move on to the next case. Um, yeah, just um, so so we know statistically that, um, you know, benzos and opioids are not good in the long term. Um, the last thing I'd want to do is, uh, precipitate a withdrawal in this patient. So I think if you're going to continue for the short term, then that's fine. But 
the gist of my comment is mainly just that um, assuming that she has a confirmed diagnosis of bipolar disorder, these patients can be extremely difficult to treat. You know, episodes of mania or hypomania, you know, the impulsiveness that goes with that, um, it can be extremely difficult to treat their substance abuse disorder. So, you know, I would, if, if not done so already, I would want to make sure that we have psychiatry involved in the care of this patient. And then if we're going to move her from, you know, away from a GABA or a gabapentinoid, particularly, you know, as we move forward or looking at the long term or discharge, that, that that's coordinated with uh, any neuroleptic uh, agents that may be added and, you know, working closely with our uh, psychiatry colleagues. That's good. Thank you. Keith Burkhardt has a question about pregabalin. Keith, you're unmuted. Well, yeah, yeah, I was just curious if people, uh, I think pregabalin's coming off patent in that, uh, this year, and I was wondering if people were starting to see cases of that as well as gabapentin. I'm just curious. That that seems, in my perspective, that seems a little bit more common initially when it initially came out. It's really more potent, and I think a stronger effect. But um, the ease of availability of gabapentin that's not controlled um, tends to fly under the radar. Um, I definitely the trends for gabapentin are much much higher than pregabalin in my experience. Gloria, do you have any comments from the methadone maintenance program? Well, certainly um, a pregabalin is very common uh, in the methadone maintenance program, and a lot of people get it from PCPs for pain. Um, some of them prefer it to gabapentin for boosting the high of, um, of uh, whatever other opiates they're, they're taking. Yeah, so we basically we have, have a problem with both. <laughs> yeah, and I, I've seen, you know, lumped into this class called the gabapentinoids, which often Baclofen is added to. They're structurally analog, um, analog of GABA, but um, pregabalin, gabapentin, and baclofen often use somewhat interchangeably. And very frequent meds to find in somebody, you know, with an opiate use disorder. Baclofen is used off-label for cocaine craving. I don't think very effective, and um, it seems to be less um, euphoric from descriptions and looking at chat rooms compared to the pregabalin and gabapentin, but some people really, really like gabapentin. Um, and often I'll see some of these prescribed together. They're on pregabalin and baclofen or gabapentin and baclofen or even gabapentin and pregabalin. Um, so certainly an opportunity to educate patients. Now this patient was, um, uh, she knew she had a, a been kind of kept on hold with her opiate treatment program and um, she had already contacted the other opiate treatment program in town, which she commented is more, you know, more lenient harm reduction. Um, she'll not be discharged for the use of other substances and, and um, uh, cocaine. So she was going to try and get in there and didn't seem too worried and wasn't planning on following up with the halfway house or other recommendations. So um, she did well and was going to follow up in the opiate treatment program at discharge. Another third case is another gabapentin case. It's a 57-year-old grandmother. She uh, says she was in opiate withdrawal and heroin withdrawal and fell asleep after taking her daughter's gabapentin. She drove off the road, had a head-on collision. Fortunately, she was okay. She was brought into the hospital. Um, initially, there was some concern. The, she told the police that she used heroin the day before, and she took some gabapentin, and the initial diagnosis, she was not really injured. The, diagnosis was syncope, so she had a syncope workup, and then it was discovered that she took this extra gabapentin and thought the combination of withdrawal exhaustion, she also had cocaine in her system that um, you know, she had the accident because she was sleepy and impaired. On bedside assessment, um, we were consulted for opiate withdrawal. The next morning, she is in opiate withdrawal. She's dysphoric, restless, has sweat, has uh, hyperactive bowel sounds, tearing, she's the opiate withdrawal scale would indicate moderate withdrawal. Uh, she lives about 40 minutes outside the city and not a lot of access to OTP or buprenorphine waiver physicians. Um, has not has heard of buprenorphine, but not doesn't hasn't tried it before. And um, she's willing to come back into the city potentially uh, for treatment if needed. And she is also concerned about 
her family situation. She lives with her daughter who has a severe cocaine addiction and the seven month old granddaughter who she has custody of because of the daughter's addiction and she's worried on what's gonna happen with this. So what are your options for withdrawal and what would someone do in this case? There's not a lot of resources um, out where she's at, but um, what are your thoughts for withdrawal? Or even in general, in, in the ED and the hospital, when somebody's going into withdrawal like this, what are, what are people doing? Let me see, Ingrid, so I have not heard from Ingrid Ficus. Can you comment? Should be unmuted. What about Leslie Guy? Leslie Guy? Um, I don't, I, I was reading, a, can you hear me? Yes. I don't know if this new, they talked about the telemedicine, if there's any option. I don't even know. How, I was going to ask you how that works. I read that thing about telemedicine, and I don't know if that's something that you can do with a patient in another physician's office, or if that's, you know, is there anything that can be done for people that don't live in a place where they have access to, I mean, I live 40 minutes from the city and I drive there for everything. So part of that is like, you know, part of me says, whoa, drive 40 minutes, big deal. You only have to go once a month. But I yeah, think no, call, those are great call, a ambulance, call a ambulance and go see the doctor once a month for 40 minutes. But I don't think that's going to be able yeah, those are those are good comments. I think she's worried about potentially driving after this accident and police involvement and all of that as well. And um, being able to consistently come, you know, um, I'm going to unblock Nick Naka and have him comment. Um, Nick, you should be unmuted. Sorry, Tim, can you hear me? Nick, Yep, go ahead. Um, you know, I don't uh I don't know that I have a particular comment. I the 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 comment she makes about uh telemedicine I think is really intriguing. I hadn't considered it. Um I think, you know, typically what we do on our services look for resources that the patient can actually access if we're gonna start them on buprenorphine and that's a question to ask even before you do the induction, I think. Yeah, so good. Um you know, that it can take some time trying to find an accurate list of x waivered physicians. And uh, I think my perspective is that giving, getting the patient out of withdrawal, and even if there's not a, the ability to bridge, is very useful um, and allows, you know, patients going to be able to communicate and um, think clearly and make some decisions potentially, uh, coordinate their discharge. And, you know, when they're in withdrawal and dysphoric and they're just thinking about opiate use, that's not very productive. So. Um, we gave a dose of, she had a fairly low level habit, um, four to five bags a day injection, didn't have a lot of stigmata, but she was in pretty significant withdrawal. It's pretty obvious. So we gave um, a two milligram dose at night. Um, the consult was in the afternoon, another recommended another two milligram dose after that. And then to go up to eight, if she still had obvious signs of withdrawal and that wasn't done, the next morning she's looking better, but is having some nausea a little vomiting still, but energy better, and she's just not out of withdrawal. So we advised on a higher dose of uh, the buprenorphine and are able to um, link to an ambulatory detox associated with our program and kind of a pilot program where the patient can come in daily for a certain period and either be tapered or ideally they would then use that time to explore resources and either get them into the ongoing treatment group counseling or link to another provider or potentially look at methadone. It depends on, you know, I guess patient characteristics. I'll let um, Dr. Bashevitz, maybe you can comment a little bit on the ambulatory detox. 
Okay, so um, this is also particular to New York State, but probably similar in other states. Actually, the state has an interesting name for it. It calls it uh, ancillary withdrawal services, meaning um, that it's not a full um, outpatient detox where we detox from every uh, every drug and give um, all sorts of uh, ancillary supportive care, but um, what what we do is um, there's a this is sort of a loophole within the New York State uh, Oasis laws uh, where uh, we are allowed to either detox a person uh, from opiates using uh, buprenorphine or um, if that person then says hey I like this buprenorphine uh, let me stay on it we are also allowed to do that to bring them directly into the program and. Um, ask them to follow through with groups and uh, whatever other things that we recommend for them, or even to flip them to methadone maintenance if they need that level of care. So it, we're looking forward to doing uh, some good things with this eventually, trying to pilot this. The devil is in the details. No, that's certainly true. There's Fortunately, we have a lot of options in the area for accessing um, you know, the, the ambulatory detox, but also um, a couple of the outpatient treatment programs now have rolling admissions that would be able to accept the patient bridged on medication within a couple of days at the longest or over the weekend or even next day if, if need be. There's a Monday slot and a Tuesday slot held in the morning for somebody coming from the ED or hospital from the outpatient work. I'm, I'm the medical director at of and one of the other programs as well has a fairly flexible uh, acceptance and then our Highland, our, our family, one of our family medicine programs is offloading the, our sister hospital ED for patients that come in. They will uh, partner with the ED physician to then accept them and send a couple of day bridge prescription in until the patient's able to contact the social worker affiliated with the primary care clinic and then get set up with that. And um, that's just in the first stage stages um, I know Syracuse has a bridge clinic, Ross Sullivan had established in the ED, bringing the patient back to the ED and then linking them to an outpatient program. Um, though where access is a problem, potentially, it is very hard for some individuals to navigate the SAMHSA list or to get an appointment with an x ray for physician. So um, the other issue in this case is this grandmother is a primary caregiver of a seven-month-old uh, she has a urine that's positive cocaine, opiates, gabapentin, THC, and a panel had been done. And I'm wondering, the question came up is, what are our obligations to report to CPS? This is from the hospitalist service that was managing her. The child was not in the car during the MDA. So what, what do people think? What are the thoughts about CPS reporting? Let me see, someone I haven't called on or hasn't chatted. How about, um, Richard Tovar, I'm gonna unmute you. Do you have any comments or thoughts about CPS reporting? Having trouble unmuting. If you're trying to talk, I apologize, some of the individuals, it's hard. Some of the attendees, it's hard to unmute is something with the... What about Beth? Do you have any thoughts about CPS reporting? Beth Gilden? Yeah. So, I mean, in, in Georgia, our requirements for mandated reporting are only that, um, that a caregiver has a positive urine, and that is enough <laughs> To, to trigger the mandate to report in Georgia. Um, I don't think we necessarily do it that often, and certainly, you know, especially for any, any parent who is in a treatment program, I'm going to be a huge advocate to try and keep the, the child with the parent, but this does not sound like that sort of situation. You know, this, this woman is, is living with the mom who, who is living with her daughter who's lost custody of the child, and this patient's stated that she's actively using heroin pretty much on a daily basis, and this is, I would absolutely report this to CPS. 
because even though the kid wasn't in the car, this isn't a safe home environment. So. And, and Tim, Thank this you. is. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, sorry. This is Beth Bilden with you, Dad. I, I agree, and I'm in Minnesota, and I'm in a county that has pretty uh, strict oversight. And so without question, I think this is a reportable case. I think we would be at risk at the hospital if we didn't report this. Um, and then in terms of the urine drug test, you know what I typically do, if, if there's a question about sort of what's going on in this case where it involves a child, I'll usually send the hospital drug test for confirmation so that they have that as it goes to whether it, so this will, for us would, if needed, go to civil court as opposed to criminal, but I still will send the confirmation. All those are very good points. We had a recent case where um, there was a poisoning by a caregiver that you know, the hot screens as part of the legal matter after the, after the um, hospitalization um, was very important to the court, the attorney, um, and you know how we determined use of a various substance from the clinical exam as well as the urine. So, Keenan, you have a. I'm going to unmute Keenan Bora. Bora is raised his hand. Yeah, thanks. I, uh, I'm assuming that this uh, urine drug screen. This was a GCMS and not an immunoassay. And I guess I'm wondering, would you guys feel as comfortable um, reporting all? immunoassay results, do you guys reflexively get GCMSs on all positive cocaines that you're going to be reporting to CPS? You know, that's a, that's a good question. I would feel comfortable not potentially um, even doing a, G, a GCMS if need, if, if um, this was done, I wanted to confirm the gabapentin, so there's a type of test that'll pick that up on the initial qualitative screen and then report without, without a level. Um, you know, because clinically she had opiate withdrawal um, and she admitted to heroin and IV use and um, the taking the gabapentin. And I think actually it turned out she was coming into the city to try and get some heroin because she was in withdrawal. And, and yeah, so this, this was um, reported to CPS. And although the thought was, um, yes, the child's not in, a, in a, not in a safe environment, but this is a opportunity for you know, the family really to take a step in the right direction. And things are not going well. This grandmother and daughter, both with, you know, bad addictions and a very young child, and now likely really new legal issues um, for the grandmother and community. Um, I think that potentially also knowing that CPS is involved may also be somewhat of a motivation to remain attached with treatment. Um, because she's going to be following up with an ambulatory detox, and so that was kind of some of the thoughts, as well as obviously the concern that you know the kid's going to be in a safe environment. And from the, the grandmother's description, it didn't sound like that the daughter was really there participating, and it, there was a lot of concern, so that was reported. And she was linked to the ambulatory detox, did well with the eight milligram uh, dose. She just needed more uh, buprenorphine, and um, that's the case. I've got, we've got just a couple minutes. I mentioned we talked briefly about fentanyl, and um, for the next three or four minutes, I've got four different examples, and I want to get, I don't have the, the actual results, but the, we've had, um, in one of the outpatient settings, some challenges with the fentanyl assay, and um, I want to get some feedback. We've got opportunity to get a qualitative fentanyl screen followed by confirmatory tests with LCMS, tandem mass spec, and um, have in the panel the ability to obtain buprenorphine, metabolite levels, you know, the standard drugs of abuse along with the gabapentin, and then the confirmatory testing is for fentanyl and norfentanyl, and the report, the threshold for reporting for fentanyl is, is um, uh, 0.5 nanograms per milliliter, and for norfentanyl, uh, 10 nanograms per milliliter. I've been getting some interesting results. Um, so the first question is, patient has an ounce of oxen doing well and has a positive fentanyl, qualitative mm -hmm. only, no um, confirmatory result that takes about a week. Um, in one of the future sessions, we can maybe 
get some input on, you know, what to do while waiting for the result, um, you know, do you, does it change any of your care or frequency or follow-up? But um, in any case, this patient has normal levels of buprenorphine metabolites, so it's kept on uh, the medication. There's no changes. And um, the fentanyl and norfentanyl were confirmed negative. So um, how often and what are potential false positives with fentanyl? Does anybody have any comments or thoughts? We've seen false positive results for fentanyl amino assay, which obviously are much more um, common now since much of the heroin is not heroin it's, or, it's, or even containing opiates, it's containing synthetic opioids and a variety of ones. So false positives for fentanyl. What about anyone still on the panel? Elena, have you seen any false positives? Are you aware of any false positives with fentanyl? I'm not aware of any for fentanyl, no. Um, we use just an amino assay here that was added to our general urine tox screen, uh, the general, you know, kind of run-of-the-mill crappy UDS that everyone orders in the ED. Um, and tons of fentanyl positive urines, but I don't, I haven't come across any of those that have been false positives. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Derek Eisner had um, commented that risperdone can uh, cause a false positive in uh, some of the assays, um, and I've seen information about some of the tricyclics as well as. Uh, older antipsychotics, chlorpromazine. Um, some of the fentanyl analogs will have um, some cross-reactivity, certainly, and actually some metabolism to, to both fentanyl or norfentanyl, but um, others won't. So um, I'll, I will, um, it, I think it, it depends also on the assay specifically, the sensitivity, the specificity in which, um, you know, there, there, there are reported false positives for some of the amino assays that are out, the dipsticks, uh, cups. Um, I will send a list after to the group, those of you in attendance, from what I find in the literature. I haven't spent enough time looking other than seeing some of the tricyclics and antipsychotics, really. Um, it's not as complex as the opiate, the morphine-based kind of opiate, certainly, so it certainly seems possible that there's more potential for false positive than, you know, other drugs of abuse. Uh, the second patient is a qualitative fentanyl positive and very low trace confirmed fentanyl and norfentanyl levels on LCMS, but very low. I mean, this is right at or right above the threshold of detection, and um, they have good buprenorphine metabolite levels as well. So. If no one raises their hand in kind of the interest of time, this one is possible that some of the fentanyl analogs are, much, are a little more lip, lipid soluble than others, and this could just simply be, depending on how long ago the use was, just some redistribution and, you know, that this low level is there from more, um, from not frequent use, but some more, more remote use. Um, and it's going to vary depending on the analog potentially, but, um, Fentanyl should have um, no detection for most um, patients after just a couple of days, uh, unless they've got something in their nose, if they had a lot of infiltration, and you could have a little bit of a depot there and run into this and detox with individuals having you know, lack of withdrawal symptoms if they're heavy intranasal users and they really need to go and clean out their nose before they get ready for a buprenorphine induction and, and possibly a patch that could be a depot. but intermittent IV use, it should be out in a couple of days. So, um, yeah, the good buprenorphine level is reassuring, and um, the patient would have been continued on the medication. But in the second case is low minimal buprenorphine, uh, the, the final case is low buprenorphine metabolite levels and a gentleman falling asleep in group, the qualitative positive and very low levels of metabolites in parents. Um, this case is just simply 
uh, use, not a lot of use, and fentanyl is a very short-acting opioid, probably had very low levels of use and inter intermittently using fentanyl, and so this is going to be a, a true positive and probably not from remote use, use the clinical parameters. So does anybody have any other comments on drug tests? We've gone over just by a couple minutes. Um, there was great attendance. We have done this the third Friday of the month regularly from 1.15 to 2.30. Um, this is recorded if anybody's interested in accessing the recording and we'll make that available. And for future third Friday uh, presentations, if there's any other sites or individuals that have cases, uh, email me and we'll have you prepare some slides and, and present uh, in the same format as the uh, noon case conference. So I want to thank you all for joining and attending. It was a good discussion and uh, have a great weekend. We're at our time limit. Thanks, Tim. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you.